Hello, my name is Nick Bowman. I'm an Associate Professor of Communication Studies at West Virginia University and one of the co-authors of your textbook for COM 105, An Introduction to Computer Mediated Communication, A Functional Approach. Um, this presentation is going to cover Chapter 1 of the textbook, and I'll go over some of the highlighted points, and um, we'll talk a bit about ways in which you might be able to apply some of the lessons from Chapter 1 to your eCampus discussions, um, other homework assignments, and then hopefully your uh, your day-to-day -day work. I want to start off by giving a quick introduction to the class and the book, this being the very um, first week of lectures and first chapter. Hopefully by now you've had a chance to read the book's introduction, and if you haven't, I would encourage you to do so. But one of the things you're going to read about is a man named Dr. Mark Lepre, psychologist at Stanford University, who is rather involved in the study of technology acceptance and how people use and take up these different tools. And one of the things he talks about in his, uh, in his discussions and writings is how quickly technology develops. And the example he gives often is that he talks about how, you know, today's computers are relatively affordable. Uh, many of you probably have a laptop or a notebook or maybe even a smartphone or a smartwatch that you can purchase from anywhere in the neighborhood of 200 to $1,000, uh, maybe a little more, maybe a little less based on where you live. And that computer that you hold in your hand, on your watch, in your eyes if you have Google Glass, has more processing power than the earliest space shuttles and the earliest machines that were used to launch nuclear missiles and other types of what we would consider very important technologies or very massive technologies. And one of the ways that he describes the growth of computing technology is by discussing cars. And he says that if automobiles had developed the same rate that computers developed, Today, we'd all be driving a Rolls Royce or a Lexus or a Lamborghini, rather, or a Ferrari. Imagine your favorite sort of um, expensive car. And that car would probably cost in the neighborhood of 2 to $3. It would get 3 million miles a gallon and would probably have enough power to tow an aircraft carrier. And, of course, the point Leffer's making is the way technology is just a fascinating study in um, innovation. And we study this because as we have advanced computing and advanced computers, in some ways it changes how we might see the world. And if you look at the graph in front of you, what you'll notice is that technology's growth is relatively linear uh, through most of the 20th century, right until about the time we start using the internet and start using digital, uh, digital um, file storage and other techniques that allowed us to take all of this information about our social worlds put it in our pockets, access it from anywhere, and be mobile. And we see that those elements caused a major rapid uptake in the speed of technology innovation. And I might invite you to read um, this uh, photo on your own. You can click on the image, and, and it'll take you to a link. You can click around, sort of read the history of all this technology. This is a graph sponsored by the company Intel, um, which uh, probably made the chips in your computer here. But the point we're trying to make is that we see this rapid advancement in how we use technology. And of course, when we have rapid advancements like this, it, it causes us to ask the question, you know, how might these technologies influence the way we see the world and the way that we might interact with the world? So there's a man named um, Moore, and he was actually one of the founders of Intel. And uh, one of the things he talked about is Moore's Law. And he was explaining that back in the 60s, he was noticing already this sort of rapid uh, advancement in the power of uh, computing technology. And as computers had more power and more memory, they could do more things. And he was also noticing that they could do more things in smaller spaces. And he had argued that the, um, the amount of uh, power, so to speak, that a computer has was doubling every year. And so it was following this exponential growth. And two great examples are on the left here, you see one of the very first computers uh, used by the US military called a NIAC, and it was a uh, computer the size roughly of a room, and it ran off a series of over 19,000 vacuum tubes that set in different configurations could do relatively basic calculations, such as tracking the trajectory uh, of, a, uh, of a missile or possibly, you know, helping a physicist solve an equation, you know, relatively advanced mathematics, but um, it was essentially limited to being a computer, something that computes the answers to problems. And you contrast that with on the right side here, and we see a pair of Google Glass. And these glass fit on your on your head. They display all this information through your eye. You can um, take photos, take videos. You can access your email, talk to friends, go online, surf the internet. 
by blinking your eye, you can check different web pages, you can talk to the glass, they can talk back to you. Um, the little nub that sits behind your ear holds 12 gigabytes of storage, which is, I don't even know exactly how to compare that to the amount of storage in the Anayat computer. In fact, that might be a challenge for one of you in the eCampus profile to kind of calculate that. Um, but the point I'm making and the point that I think uh, Moore's Law was sort of meant to establish is that computers are growing rapidly and they continue to go rapidly. And we tend to think of it as kind of this magical, you know, innovation, but it's actually relatively predictable where we're on a path to increasingly take our world and its information and make it digital. And so one of the things we ask is communication scholars is how might that process alter the way in which we see each other and, and the way we see the world. Because something kind of interesting about technology is that while technology changes rapidly, according to Moore and Lepper and the examples, people really don't. And um, what's remarkably interesting about technological advancement is oftentimes whenever there's a technology, there's a fear associated with it. Telephones are gonna ruin our privacy. Social media causes us not to talk to each other anymore. And there's all of these panics around how technology is going to change us for the worst. And yet time and time again, what we see is that when we get these technologies, these communication technologies, right? These are technologies that allow us to access information and share it with each other. They don't take us away from our past. They don't tend to corrupt us. But in fact, many scholars argue, such as Christakis and Fowler in their book Connected, that they actually draw us closer to the past because they draw us closer to each other. Um, you know, the, the idea of social media sort of means just that. These are technologies that are social in nature. And while we won't read his, their book for class, you might check out the book Connected to kind of read some of their arguments about the role of technology in society. And I don't see it as my, my role in this course to sort of convince you that it's one way or the other. But rather, what I like to do is open you up to thinking about the functions of technology in society rather than the assumptions that the effects are good and the effects are bad. And we'll talk about a lot of this throughout the semester about what is the functional impact of technology on how we talk. At the end of the day, technologies help us satisfy goals. And in fact, this book and this course is based around sort of four broad goals of information technology or communication technology. The first is that we've, we get information. Um, one of the ways that we use technology is to get information about the world, uh, learn about the news, learn about each other. You know, the New York Times might be where you go to read about the world. You might go to Facebook to read about your friends. We form relationships, right? We use technologies to talk to each other, whether it's calling your mother or texting your girlfriend or getting on Tinder and finding people that way or uh, going through Yik Yak and laughing at jokes. We oftentimes use technologies to form associations with other people or other organizations. And we've been doing this since we started writing letters to each other across the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean or wherever you're from in the world. In terms of persuasion, we use technologies to find out about things so we can change our mind. We use technologies to debate and discuss. We use technologies to advertise to each other, right? The whole idea here is that we do use media to try to persuade each other to come around to our point of view. And anybody who's been on Facebook lately and following, you know, world events um, sees how people will take to Facebook and sort of debate and discuss hot issues of the day. And then finally, entertainment. Um, we've commonly used technology to have a good time, whether it's listening to the radio or watching TV or playing a video game. Um, we like to have free time to ourselves uh, whenever possible. And it's not something that we should sort of ignore as being frivolous or unimportant because in fact, what people do in their free time often says a great deal about who they are as people. So with that, let's start chapter one, where we're gonna talk about this notion of mediated communication. Now I should forward this by, by suggesting that the chapter one is very basic. It's really meant to be an overview, um, a definitional chapter to kind of get you used to some of the terminology we're gonna use in class. So the purpose of this chapter is primarily to orient you to some of the definitions and the terms that we're gonna use throughout the semester. So some of the questions I want you to think about as we go through chapter one are what is communication? How do we define it? 
how do we separate mass communication from interpersonal communication? And, and how do we talk about uh, mediated communication? What do those words mean? We want to know what CMC stands for, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but it's computer mediated communication. We want you to think a bit about um, considering the different elements of the communication process, the message, the senders and the receivers. And then finally, we want you to think about this notion of narrow casting. This is something you're going to read about in your book, and we'll talk about briefly during our, our presentations here in chapter one. Now, as I, before I move in, I always offer a reading check to all of the students to make sure that you're on top of your materials and that you understand sort of where you're at in the semester. Um, so for the four questions displayed on the screen right now, um, if you don't know the answers to those questions now, what I might uh, suggest you do is pause this presentation and go back and read the chapter. Um, it's easier oftentimes to go through these lectures once you've already read the chapter. And uh, these reading checks will kind of give you an idea that did you read the right things? Are you recalling enough information from the chapter to be successful in the course? So I'm going to pause for a moment. And then once you can answer these four questions on your own, I would invite you to move the presentation on to the next slide. OK, so what is communication? And this might seem like an incredibly silly kind of surface level question to ask. But it does have an important definition. And according to Jim McCroskey and Virginia Richmond, uh, two former West Virginia University uh, faculty members, um, communication is defined as a process by which we stimulate meaning in the minds of others using verbal and nonverbal messages. And I want to draw your attention to this notion of stimulating meaning in the minds of others, because one of the most, I think, fundamental flaws about how most people approach the study of communication or the, the way that most people communicate with each other is we think about it in terms of what we said. We think about it in terms of, you know, what I meant to say to you, and that's the important thing, right? So if my friends don't understand me, it's because they didn't understand my message. Well, communication scholars would say that that's a problem, but it's not a problem of your friends. It's a problem of you. It's a problem of not recognizing the disconnect between the meaning that you meant to suggest and the meaning that you actually stimulated in your friends' minds. That in many ways, communication, if you go to point number two there, is an audience-centered process. We communicate for others' benefit, not for our own benefit. One of the ways to think about this is communication is sort of taking your internal dialogue, the thoughts and opinions and feelings in your mind, and making sure other people have the same thoughts and feelings and opinions. It's also an ongoing process, which we'll explore here on the next slide, where communication isn't something that happens once. It happens within very complex systems, whether it's two people or 2,000 or 2 million. And it can also be both verbal and nonverbal. Um, we often think about the words that we say, but we don't often think about our body language, our gestures, our tone of voice, our time, the time of day, the symbols you might use in our communication, the hand gestures. These are all very important parts of a message. In fact, some scholars argue that as much as 70% of the stimulated meaning in the minds of others can be from these nonverbal cues. So communication is a process. And in fact, it's a process um, that was modeled most eloquently by a couple of telephone engineers named Shannon and Weaver, uh, hence the name of this model, the Shannon Weaver model, which you can read about more in chapter one of the textbook. The point of this model was actually to try to explain how telephones physically work. And so you have an information source, a person, and they speak into a telephone receiver, like a handset. And what that receiver does is it takes the voice the person makes, translates it into electrical impulses, sends those impulses down a telephone line to another receiver. Then that receiver takes the impulses, converts them into a speaker that vibrates in the receiver of the message, the person's voice. So when you call your mom, what's actually happening is you call mom and you talk about the day and that talking gets translated into ones and zeros that are sent through wireless signals to your mom's cell phone. And then she doesn't hear ones and zeros. Of course, she hears your voice. So long as there isn't a lot of noise, uh, bad connections, bad environment, weather, like physical noise, uh, it's loud in the background or it could be emotional or semantic noise. It could be the case that maybe your mom's in a really bad mood um, and doesn't want to listen to you. Maybe they're busy. You've all had that time where you've called somebody and they're, they're clearly busy 
And you can tell by the fact that they're not really attending to your message, right? And the point of this model is to showcase that there's a lot of different elements in this process, right? Now, in our class, we're going to study this sort of uh, dashed binding box here, the communication channel. Because one of the things that we're going to continue to discuss for the rest of the semester is the extent to which this box might actually change the message itself. You can imagine, for example, if you were to break up with your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your partner, and if you were to have that breakup face to face versus having that breakup through a text message, you can imagine how the exact same message might be heard very differently. Um, the face to face message might be more dramatic, but it might be more sincere. Whereas the text message might be seen as very impersonal and very rude. Although from an efficiency standpoint, if you're breaking up with somebody, perhaps the text message is the way to, to keep your distance. That being said, this model also suggests this notion of the audience-centered process. Notice how the destination is really the important thing here. Shannon and Weaver weren't concerned with what the person holding the phone meant to say. They were concerned with getting that person's message all the way down the line to a receiver and to finally a destination and keeping the message intact, right? Making sure that what the person said was actually received in the same way. And these different parts of the process all have the potential to either help or hurt that uh, message uh, reception process. And of course, you can go backwards. If the destination were to talk back to the source, all these arrows would simply reverse, but it'd still be an audience-centered model. Now, one of the things that we need to clarify in the rest of our course is separating this notion of mass and interpersonal communication. And um, what we might think about is that when we talk about mass communication, in the ways that you've probably often heard of mass communication or mass media, would be things like television and newspapers, right? They have very large audiences. Uh, there's this number 50 that's thrown around. It's not really that important of a number. I think the point is that you're directing a message towards lots and lots of people at one time. You're broadcasting the news. You're writing an article on a newspaper or a website. Oftentimes, the source is rather anonymous. And what we mean by that is you might know the author of the article or the name of the person delivering the news that day. But the author and that person, they don't represent themselves. They represent a very large organization, let's say ESPN or People Magazine or, you know, the Charleston uh, newspaper. And, of course, the notion here is that um, in these cases, there's lots of people involved to the point where there is no clear source, a one source per se. Um, the goal and because of that, the goals of these organizations are very complex and multiple. I'm a former journalist, and when I would tell stories, my goal was to tell my audience the truth and was to tell them what's happening. I covered the court system in, 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 the, in the state of Missouri. I covered the federal courts. And to tell people what sort of decisions were our federal judges making about the laws in the state of Missouri and beyond. But that wasn't the only goal of the organization, right? The newspaper I worked for, um, they also wanted to sell advertising. Uh, they also wanted to make sure circulation was high. They also wanted to make sure that my stories were balanced with other stories and there were opinions in the newspaper. So there's lots of different goals from lots of different people in this relatively anonymous source. And the, the modality of communication for mass communication is almost always mediated. What we mean by this, is it always goes through a channel. Rarely did I go into the streets and talk to people and tell them stories. Rather, what I would do is I would write those stories on my computer or on my typewriter and I would send them to the newspaper and the newspaper would distribute them for me. And of course, the paper is the medium by which these mass audiences got my story that was edited by somebody else and laid out by somebody else with a headline by somebody else and a photo by somebody else. Right. It's a way to get lots of information out to lots of people in a very efficient manner, but it's not very personal. Right. So interpersonal communication, very intimate audiences. You know, when my partner and I are talking, when my wife and I are talking, this would be a very intimate audience. It's her and I and that's it. Very personal source. She knows that anything I'm telling her is coming directly from me and vice versa. So we, we have an idea of who we're talking to. And because of that, we often tend to alter our communication to kind of fit the person that we're discussing with and, and make sure that we kind of all stay on the same page. I can adjust messages specifically for her interests and, and needs, right? 
the goals are usually clear. As long as you're not trying to deceive your partner, um, usually the goals we have for interpersonal communication are quite clear. We want to decide on what's going to be for dinner this evening. We want to decide on how what color to paint the house. We want to decide on whose parents to go visit. We want to express that we love each other. We want to express that we're fighting. You know, we have relatively clear goals when we're talking to, to one another. And most often, the communication is non-mediated, right? Um, we, we, we live in the same home. We can talk to each other over the dinner table. Um, we can go in the backyard and talk. We can go for a walk and talk to each other. You know, and, and that tends to be the way interpersonal communication uh, is handled. Of course, you're probably thinking that we don't always use face-to-face. -face. In fact, there's oftentimes we use media to talk to each other, text message, cell phone. Um, in the summers, I live in Germany. I teach at the University of Erfurt. And oftentimes, the only way her and I can talk is through uh, what you might be considered mass media, Facebook, for example. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. If you're having that suspicion, you're on the right track because the lesson that we're going to hit for today is that the distinction between mass and interpersonal is a tricky one that may not be very useful. In fact, this thing called mediated communication sort of changes things a little bit because lots of our daily interactions with the sort of development of technology have become increasingly mediated where we use screens and tools to interact with each other. And that's sort of changing how we think about the communication process. You might distinguish between mass and media in terms of thinking about like comparing, let's say television or newspapers to the internet and gaming, right? Let's go ahead and use those technologies. And of course the big difference might be that television and newspapers aren't very interactive. You get the message, you read the message, you put down the message, you get the message, you turn on the TV, you turn off the TV, that's really it. But of course, with the internet and with like a video game, um, you can touch the message, right? When, when the person sends you something online, I can click on it. I can read it differently. I can copy and paste it. I can look up more information. I can look up different sources. I can alter the message. And we're going to talk about how important that is to the study of communication. So for mass channels, there aren't very many, right? There's only so many television channels. There's only so many radio stations. There's only so many newspapers. And while you might feel, well, your TV has a lot of channels, uh, personally at my house in Morgantown, I have about 900 channels on my television. There are far more internet uh, websites, right? I can go online and, and there are potentially tens of millions of different channels, so to speak, that I can get information from. With television audiences, typically we're thinking about one broad audience. When, when the uh, Pittsburgh Pirates play a game and it's broadcast on Root Sports, Really, the only audience they're thinking about is Pirates fans. But the same broadcast online might have many different audiences. We might target Pirates fans in West Virginia, Pirates fans in Pittsburgh, people who live in Pittsburgh and don't like the Pirates, people who live in West Virginia and don't like the Pirates, people who don't like baseball, people who do like baseball. The point is that these, these um, messages through digital media can be highly customized. They can be very narrow casted. And the idea behind narrow casting is that you can take smaller groups of people and target your messages just for those groups. This is the opposite of a broadcast where you're just sending a message out to as many people as you possibly can. The control in a mass system is often the sender, right? Um, I have very little control of what's on my television other than changing the channel. But in an interactive system, in a mediated system such as like an internet uh, um, browser, I have a lot of control over what I see and, and when I see it. And this has to do a lot with transmission down below. Television and newspapers and these types of quote unquote mass communication um, tend to be things that are very, very scheduled. They're on a format, they're one way. You know, I don't often interact back with my TV or newspaper. I mean, sometimes I yell at the TV when the Mountaineers are losing, but it doesn't necessarily uh, do anything for the screen. Whereas with these uh, digital technologies, these mediated technologies, they're very interactive. I can touch the message. I can touch and change the message. They're on demand. Um, if all of us right now had Netflix, we could essentially dial up whichever sort of message we felt like dialing up at the time. And then one of the things we'll talk about a little later in class has to do with learning. And then when we learn from the mass media, it's typically through what's called modeling. That is, we see something happening on screen, we remember it, and we try to do it ourselves. Whereas with interactive technologies, which might be a better word than mediated, 
we tend to experience the content, right? The notion here is that we actually have a chance to do it ourselves. We can um, play solitaire on our computer and learn how to play cards. We can um, read about different, you know, we can make decisions. And as a result, we can learn from those decisions, such as like in a video game. Another incredibly important thing to consider when we're talking about sort of the digital um, revolution, this notion of sort of technology's rapid changes, is the notion of digitization. And when we're talking about digitization, that's this notion of binary code, where you take information and you translate it into a series of ones and zeros, and that tends to be the language of computers. Um, zero means off and one means on, and that's how circuit boards and microprocessors essentially process all this information that we're sending to them. It's a very basic, fundamentally, and universal language. Well, this notion of digitization has allowed us to take incredibly complex parts of our real worlds and put them in digital spaces. For example, this photo on the bottom of your screen that I'm hovering now is a library. Um, libraries are wonderful places. They are the houses of knowledge. They are the places that store our human history, our human present, and maybe even our human future. We learn a lot about our environments through the books contained in these libraries, and they're usually pretty important to societies. However, that entire library, as beautiful and as exquisite as that picture is, probably fits on your laptop today. Um, we can fit, you know, terabytes of memory on our cellular phones, I've, um, or access the information on our phones. And an example that I often give is that I travel quite a bit. And um, one day I was in uh, Northern Germany giving a lecture on um, communication research. I was talking about the social media and um, video games. And someone asked for a copy of some of my recent research. And I was thinking that, you know, a couple hundred years ago, or maybe even 30 years ago, I would have had to have gone home, um, printed off whichever um, article or articles the person wanted, put them in the mail, and probably mailed them back to Germany, because it was unlikely that I was going to carry my entire collected personal publications with me on the road. Um, I've published, you know, over 100 articles, either presented or published. That's quite a lot of paper. If I was like a 300 years ago, I would have had to write it all down. It would have taken me months just to write it out again. Well, in that meeting in Germany, the guy asked for this information, and I opened my cell phone. I was able to download four or five of my research studies, and I was able to send them to him via Bluetooth right to his laptop. It took about three minutes to get all the information. And of that three minutes, I would say two and a half of those minutes were me trying to find the information because I'm not a very good, uh, I'm not very well organized on my computer. So I was able to compress all of that information into an incredibly small place and then transmit it to my friend in almost real time. And you think about how that speeds up the way we learn about the world. Another reason it was possible is this notion of conversion, is that digital technologies are very universal. All computers read ones and zeros. Um, it's not as if we have to translate the languages from one computer to the next. So while he and I don't speak the same language, in fact, my German is not very good, his, his English is better than my German, um, what was nice is that I could email him my files and he could at least open and read it for himself. And anybody who studied a foreign language realizes that sometimes reading is easier than listening and speaking. But the point I'm making here is he was able to open all those files without any problems because the computer was able to encode the files in a universal way to where they could be universally decoded. You might be familiar with what's called an Adobe.pdf file. And PDF stands for Portable Document Format. And it is one of the universal languages or file formats that we use in everyday business, academics, and culture. Because we can send files to each other. And anybody in this room can open a PDF on just about any device in the world. The final point here is the notion of convergence. And here what we're talking about is that our devices are doing more than one thing. Um, if you go into the kitchen, um, so I, I like to cook quite a bit. And if you ever just step into my kitchen, you would see lots of very specialized tools. You would see different tools for peeling and preparing different potatoes and vegetables. You would see different pots and pans for searing versus frying versus flash frying versus grilling. Um, you'd see a pancake griddle. You would see specialized equipment for eggs and specialized equipment for all sorts of very unique foods. It's almost a bit too much, quite honestly. Um, if you were to look through my cupboards, you would see um, beer glasses for all sorts of different kinds of beers. So if it's a Hefeweizen, it'd be a tall glass 
with a wide brim so that the yeast can go to the top and create the uh, the head or the flower on top of the drink. Um, if it's an espresso mug, I'm making coffee out of a very small ceramic mug because espresso is very small, very potent, and very hot. And you'd be a little puzzled, like there's a lot of stuff in here for um, a family that has no, we only have two dogs. Um, and the point I'm making there is that very specialized equipment. And, and in fact, when I cook, um, I get very particular about using the right tool for the right food at the right temperature at the right time. Well, technology is sort of um, digital technologies and communication technologies are the opposite of that. Because in fact, one of the drawbacks of that system is that when I'm, for example, living in Germany, I have a small apartment with a uh, hot plate and a couple of plate and a couple of pans. I have a hard time cooking because I'm so used to specialized tools that I have a hard time using basic tools. But I don't have a problem with my computer. In fact, when I travel, I can bring my tablet PC with me. It's my phone, my camera, my audio recorder, my video recorder. It's my book reader. It's my video game system. Think of all the things that your computer can do or your smartphone can do. In many ways, I often laugh at the notion of the smartphone because one of the things that I don't do is make phone calls on. In fact, I, I rarely make more than 100 minutes a month of actual phone calls. Yet if you were to go through my text messages, emails, Instagrams, and all sorts of other ways I communicate, I communicate all the time. And so the point is that we now have these devices we can carry around with us that aren't just phones. They're essentially our desk, our lives, our photo album. It's amazing how lonely you don't get traveling when you've got your smartphone on you. This changes the way that we see the world and the way we interact with people around us. As we've already kind of said, this distinction between mass and media and interpersonal communication may not be very useful. And a man named Patrick L. Sullivan, who's got some wonderful writings on the topic that are discussed in the chapters, suggests that the divide's never been clear. Um, we use interpersonal channels for mass reasons all the time. And the example I often give my students, and it kind of makes them feel bad, unfortunately, is this notion of the acceptance letter. And so when you apply to a university like West Virginia University, um, you, know, you send your application in, it takes a long time to get accepted, and you're waiting to see if you get to go to college or not, because that's, that's something you've been wanting to do. And you finally get a letter in the mail. And it's a very nice letter on nice paper, and it's got a seal on it and letterhead. And it's a very formal letter from the university. It's addressed to you personally. It's a very private message. And it welcomes you to the school. It's the first time someone kind of officially calls you a mountaineer. You get to join the W family. Well, letters are incredibly interpersonal things. I send, when I was a kid, I would mail letters to my grandmother. Some of you may have pen pals. Some of you might still write notes to each other that are very, very private. In fact, one of the most embarrassing things in middle school is when you write a letter to somebody you have a crush on, and the teacher takes it from you and reads it through the entire class. Well, the point I'm making about that letter from West Virginia University is as neat as it is and as personal as it feels, you realize pretty quickly that it's not personal. And in fact, they sent that same letter to thousands of other students. And in fact, it was the same letter with the same text, the same nice seal, the same manuscript, the same signature. Everything's pretty much the same except for your name, student number, and address. Now, it doesn't mean the school's doing anything rotten. They're not tricking you. And they are trying to make it feel like a personal place. But we also have 30,000 students, and it wouldn't be practical to send individually handwritten letters to everybody. The point I'm making here is that we use this interpersonal channel of the private letter in a very mass perspective to inform all the new students that they're mountaineers. We also use mass channels for interpersonal reasons. It's very common to see, for example, at a uh, football or a baseball game, someone proposed to their boyfriend or girlfriend, and you, you know, that is an incredibly intimate message, and yet it's being portrayed on this television screen for everybody to see. And so one of the things that, that O'Sullivan argues is that perhaps what we have to do is separate the channel from the actual type of communication happening on the channel. That maybe it doesn't make sense to say all newspapers are mass media and all Facebook pages are interpersonal media because it doesn't really work that way. And in fact, as the title of your book sort of suggests, we're going to take a more functional approach and we're going to look at the elements of the message rather than just simply looking at the channel itself and saying that if television, therefore mass, 
And we'll talk about that in terms of personalization and exclusivity. And I think the next slide does a great job of explaining. So here you go. This is a slide straight from O'Sullivan's reading. If you click on this um, image here, it'll take you to the O'Sullivan reading. It's, it's a pretty easy article to read and a pretty brilliant one at that. But what he argues is the best way to understand how we use technology to communicate might be by thinking about how personal a message is, right? Personal messages are messages that are written very particular for one individual. You know, a personal message is one where it's very clear the person writing it knows you. They might reference your life. They might reference you more than just by name, but they know your likes, your dislikes, your personality, your ego. They really understand who you are and they choose to write a message that showcases how well they understand you personally. An impersonal message would be a newspaper article, right? Um, it's not that it's newspaper that makes it impersonal. It's the fact that the person writing it is writing it for a large, large audience, right? We're writing a story about, you know, the, um, the tragic shootings and trials in South Carolina. That story wasn't written, like if it's in CNN, for example, it wasn't written for any particular person. It was written for anybody who's human who might want to know about what's, what was happening in that state um, in June of 2015. Another dimension O'Sullivan talks about is access exclusivity. Who has access to the information? So sometimes we send people messages that are very, very private. They're sealed envelopes, they're private Facebook messages, they're um, emails, they're meant for one person. And that tends to suggest a certain meaning behind the message. Private messages are often seen as more intimate and sometimes they're more personal, but of course, as the in the case of the acceptance letter, they're not always more personal. We also might think about public access. This is, you know, putting things out there for everybody to see. Um, Facebook status update, a uh, tweet, for example, might be very, very public. But of course, there's times where perhaps your mom or dad posted something on your Facebook page that you thought was actually very, very private information, and they shared it on your public wall. And then right away, we see a conflict, you know, where does Facebook fit into O'Sullivan's uh, categories? And in fact, I'm not going to answer that question right now. I'm going to ask you guys to go to eCampus, and I want everybody to try to tell me where does Facebook fit in O'Sullivan's different quadrants here? And I want you to tell me if it fits into one of them. Does it fit into more than one of them? And give me an example of a time that you have used Facebook or that you have seen Facebook fitting into you know, one or more of these categories. And I think I'll give you a quick hint here. I'm not sure there's a right answer for this. So I'd like to hear what you think about um, this idea. So when we say CMC, and again, the point of the first chapter is very much just to get you thinking about um, technology and communication. We're talking about computers, the use of technologies. We're talking about mediated because they carry messages. And we're talking about communication. These messages stimulate meaning in the minds of others. Very simply, our role for this class and our goal for this class in moving forward, especially if you end up majoring in communication studies, for example, is that what role does the machine, the computer, the tablet, the smartphone, Facebook, Twitter, what role do those technologies actually play in the communication process? And so in many ways, you put more focus on the first to see than the second C. So in conclusion, for chapter one, I want you to know that communication is an audience-centered process. It's about what do you do to stimulate meaning in the minds of the people around you. We want to talk about how distinguishing between mass and interpersonal communication may not be very useful anymore, considering that we don't necessarily use mass channels for mass reasons and interpersonal channels for interpersonal reasons. And furthermore, newer technologies such as Facebook and social media really blur the lines between mass and interpersonal. And we're gonna have to understand how to overcome that and better understand the differences between the, the channels rather than their functions, or the functions rather than their channels. CMC is a study of how computers impact the human communication process. And we'll talk about this throughout the rest of this semester. And as we wrap up chapter one, um, I want you to, of course, go into eCampus. There's going to be a series of questions posted every other day that I'd like you to answer. I'd also like you to, to hear from you about other questions you might have in the chapter. 
I'd love to hear your thoughts on the old Sullivan reading. I'd love to hear your thoughts on narrow casting and, and these things. But I also have kind of a challenge for you. And this is not a required part of our course. But uh, if you are somebody who's comfortable on social media, we like you to hop online, either on Twitter using the media's tool hashtag, or go to the official Facebook group of our um, Tom 105 uh, textbook here. And I want you to answer one or two questions. I want you to tell us about a time that you've used a computer or a smartphone to communicate non-verbally with somebody else. That is, is it possible to give non-verbal messages through a medium that seems to only allow you to use voice and text? I also want you to think about how exclusive do you think the messages that are posted to your Facebook wall are? And I wonder that when you write posts, do you personalize them for other readers? And here what we're kind of doing is giving personal examples of O'Sullivan's uh, dichotomy, O'Sullivan's grid there. Thanks for your time. I hope chapter one's enjoyable for you. Um, again, please go into eCampus and debate and discuss some of the issues. Follow our discussions there throughout the week and um, hit us with questions and we'll see you in chapter two. Take care.